are minimalists. What are the best foods for gut health? Now, we've talked about a lot of these things already. You've talked about apple peels. You've talked about blueberries, <clears throat> strawberries, blackberries, um, orange juice. I know that you, you talk about being uh, healing, and I assume it's because of ascorbic acid, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so so th- those are some things there. What else? What what is what is helpful for the gut? And later during the maximal, I think we'll get into the the order of operation okay. on things. Yeah. But let's let's just talk about some foods that are that are, are healing and healthy that we haven't already touched upon. Yeah. So assumption is that you are you are past the point of the inflamed gut because a lot of the things that are very healthy for the gut in an ongoing basis you can't give up front when you've got all these sort of issues. So uh, if someone has Crohn's disease, mm-hmm. for example, or or colitis. Um, or ulcers, the, what's healthy for them is going to be different from what's healthy for the person with your average gut. It's like you said, there's an order of operations yeah. to it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So they're going to need aminos and, and things like the HMOs up front, mm-hmm. and then and then you, you sort of baby step your way back into fibers. Okay, yeah. okay. But generally speaking, um, things that are healthy for the gut long term would be things like resistant starch, um, foods that have phenols. So anything with colors, like dark colors in it. Let's talk about resistant starches because I was Mm. listening to an interview you did on another podcast and you had the most hilarious Chipotle hack. Yeah, um, yeah it works. <laughs> when he goes to Chipotle, yeah. he, he puts ice in the beans. He gets the beans separate and puts ice in them. It's a great COVID attention strategy. Like if you're if you just spend too much time alone, you just go to Chipotle, go to the ice machine, and everybody's like, what are you doing? <laughs> they think, oh, this crazy guy's putting yeah. ice in his beans because they've never seen someone do that. But there's a strategy behind that. It's not that you like cold beans necessarily. It's that they do something different in the gut mm. Uh, what other foods are like that besides you know, the the cold black beans? Uh, potatoes. Okay. So potatoes. Uh, cold, cold, potatoes. cold potatoes. Yeah. yeah. In fact, there's a, there are you can look this up. There's potato diets out there where people eat nothing but potatoes and get ripped. Yeah. On potatoes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, potatoes. Potatoes do that. Just generally speaking, uh, garbanzo beans are fantastic. Probably the probably like you're a vegan, garbanzo would be my top of the list because they have so much protein in them, but mm-hmm. they also have very special long chain um, carbs in them that are very sensitizing for insulin. Mm-hmm. So they're kind of a wonder food for um, both body fat and for the gut. They're okay. very, very effective, yeah. But only cold, right? Is that the key? <clears throat> well, the difference to think of it is this way. Um, there's a state in which certain resistant starches um, don't feed you. Mm-hmm. They feed the bacteria in their gut. And then there's a state where they feed you. Mm-hmm. So in one state, um, a lot of different kinds of resistant starches when they're cold or cooled down, um, the, the, the food in them is really not digestible by you. Not all of it, but most mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. And, and you're feeding the gut. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't get a lot of energy from it. But when you heat them up, those long chain starch chains break down into simple sugars and then it feeds you. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. man. There's so many things I want to talk about here on the minimal uh, before we wrap this up. Let's talk about eating in threes really quickly. Yeah. I, I found this to be fascinating, and since I've made some changes recently, it's amazing how my satiety is affected by my previous meal. Mm. And it took me 40 years to figure that out. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> talk to me about that. Yeah. Well, so there's this really new, uh, fascinating body of research um, that has to do with meal-to-meal sequencing. And it, it's very science-based, and it, we're, we're just simply looking at the effect that a previous meal will have on the next meal. Yeah. And and you can look at all these parameters of the previous meal. So you can look at what was in it, what state was it in, how did you combine it, how much time before the next meal. And then based on all these sort of levers, you get all these different effects at the next meal. Mm-hmm. Um, so like if I ate celery and cucumbers for one meal, I might accidentally just gorge yeah. on the next meal. Yeah, because, you'll be starving. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. you'll be starving. But I see this with my clients all the time, mm-hmm. like talking about like, no, you know, your choices that you make at one meal are going to directly 100%. impact your next meal and probably several meals after that. Yes. Yeah. And where that gets really interesting is uh, in, in fat loss. So mm-hmm. what you see a lot in, in active fat loss is, oh, I ate perfectly during the day and I blew it at night. And uh, very common. And the reason is that you have to set up the evening in the morning. So the things that, and, and again, there's good research on this. Like there's research showing that um, if you have an egg at breakfast, you're going to have uh, 24 hour total food intake is going to be slightly less. Mm. If you have barley uh, at night, uh, you're going to be uh, have much greater insulin sensitivity in the morning. Uh, if you have a whey protein preload 30 minutes prior to a higher sugar meal, then you're going to have lower glucose area under the curve. And so we begin to look at meal to meal sequencing. It's like it's like jujitsu. It's like suddenly you have all these outcomes you can you can produce. Um, a good example would be. Um, uh, peanuts, a small amount of peanuts together with an orange 
um, as a preload meal, you're going to eat much less at the next meal because of the satiety value of both of those. So a preload meal would be like 30 minutes mm -hmm. before the, mm -hmm. the, the main meal. Right. You're sort of priming yourself right. to eat less by... It, 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 it's almost counterintuitive because like, well, I don't want to eat two meals within a 45-minute window, but it's actually, uh, it's almost like an appetizer in a way. Well, we've been primed to think that the only variable in the equation is calories, but but really, um, sometimes you'll actually increase calories, but to, but to increase calories, you'll increase insulin sensitivity and you'll decrease total food intake. Mm -hmm. So it's just really thinking along different lines, that's all. But um, it's power. There's a lot of power in doing it.